Okay, so we should be good. Let me see. Right. Welcome. We are live on Two Feathers uh, Virtual Indigenous Speaker Series. It is a wonderful Tuesday afternoon here in McKinleyville. For those of you that are tuning in for the first time, uh, we are about five and, a half, five and a half hours north of San Francisco in Humboldt County, right on the beautiful Pacific Ocean. And Two Feathers is a family service agency that works with Native American youth and their families. That includes all natives living in this area. Uh, today, I'm excited to have Dr. Megan Bang uh, and really talking about you know, native science, student wellness, and really a lot of her research and, and uh, things that she's done in her career. A little bit about Dr. Uh, Megan Bang is that she's uh, Ojibwe and of Italian descent. She's professor of learning sciences and psychology at Northwestern University. Dr. Bang serves as the senior vice president at the Spencer Foundation. Her research focuses on understanding culture, learning and developmental development broadly with a specific focus on the complexities of navigating multiple meaning systems in creating and implementing more effective learning environments. Of note, she's worked within the Chicago urban Indian community, as well as in the uh, Menominee uh, tribal nation, as well as in the Seattle area and at University of Washington and uh, where she currently is Northwestern University. And for those of you that are tuning in at the virtual speaker series for the first time, a little bit about why we're doing this is really that we're trying to tease out the theories, approaches, ideas, routines, tactics that guide the professionals we interview to give our community materials and information that they can apply to when working with indigenous people. It is our hope at Two Feathers that these interviews will help our audience to better understand, support, and serve native communities. Welcome, Dr. Bang. I think you're on mute. Uh, uh, thanks so much for inviting me. Um, uh, I'm just gonna start by um, introducing myself a little bit and, and kind of acknowledging where I am. I'm, I'm a Badaban de Kwe Indigenous Kost, Ninishinabe Kwe, Gigun, Indodem, Gitigan Zabing, and Gamig, Minwa, Chicago. Um, and I, I know we're in this weird virtual space, but I just wanna acknowledge that um, I'm in what is currently called Chicago, um, but these are uh, my ancestral homelands and the place that has always been kind of a uh, intertribal place of trade. And so I'm, I'm just gonna acknowledge from where I'm, I'm actually speaking, not just the digital world. Yes. Um, and you know, I, I guess I'm gonna share a little bit of screen and then I'm hoping we'll go back and forth a little bit. Um, so thank you so much for um, inviting me. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping we'll get here partly because I, I thought about, um, I, was, I was grateful for the invite um, and I hope that maybe we can um, get to, to where, where and how I, th I think about why STEAM education and why I've been doing what I've been up to. And so I guess I just wanna start by saying that I think of one of our, I think a lot with Vine Deloria's work around human maturation and what he's always meant to, or what I've taken him to have meant is that, um, we're on a trajectory as human communities about what does it mean to mature. And for me, one of the kind of key, if not the key challenges of this century is how do we cultivate just what I've called collectively adapt ad adaptable, sustainable and culturally thriving communities. And really what that means is that climate change is a big, is a big issue in this century and learning how to relive in our places well um, particularly after and through surviving settler colonialism and the disruptions it's had in our communities is kind of the big space. Um, and so for me, I'm always thinking about how can, um, and I've said science education here, but I, I mean that broadly because I think actually disciplinary divisions like saying science or reading or math is actually from Western knowledge systems. It's not really how indigenous knowledge systems work. Um, but I also think our big challenge is really recognizing how our systems need, and you started out here, uh, need to shift. And 
to recognize at their core, um, our schooling has been an assimilative endeavor. It's, it's, not, it's not been, we don't yet have systems designed um, in, in the 21st century that are for indigenous um, thriving. That's not what school systems have been. And I wanna say there's a difference between school systems and education that I think about a lot. Um, and I think that school systems could be, but they have to endeavor and want to be something. I often thought about it as schooling has been one of the tools of colonialism. The question is, is what would it take for schools to become medicine that helps contribute to family and community thriving? So that's kind of the big space that I'm in and that I think about a lot. Um, I feel like it's kind of important to me. Um, I just always like to tell people a little bit um, about where I come from. Um, and also it, when I get nervous about things, this is, helps ground me. Um, I do wanna say that um, I'm, I'm a third generation urban native person. Um, family was has been relocated, but I'm also the mom and auntie to eight kids. Um, I have um, both my own grandparents and my partner's parents are boarding school survivors. Um, but, um, and I like to weave and do these kinds of things. So this is just my family and I'm, I'm mostly saying that. So it's sort of people have a view into who is this person on the weird web <laughs> speaking out. Um, but I'll also say this, I'm also a cancer survivor um, and um, plants and returning to our own plant medicines when I was a young person is the thing that has um, helped me be a healthy adult. And so you, everyone that um, is listening should know that part of the reason I do the work that I do is about living in those right relations with those plant relatives that helped me a long time ago and really understanding um, about what, what, what those relations are about. So I also wanna acknowledge we're in, a, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, and um, in the background here is this sunrise, um, picture and I and I wanted to say that I actually think that we're in this moment of potentially remaking education and a, and a potential of remaking in general and we have a story in my community where one earth was, or one world was ending and a new one was um, being rebirthed and we have this time called Badabin where every um, every morning just before the sun actually comes out is one of our most important times of day uh, it's also when we're supposed to get up and say our morning prayers and, and, and um, humble ourselves to think about the gift of life every day. Um, and anyway, in this story of Badabin is this time where um, the people weren't living right. We weren't living in the way that we should be and, and Creator was uh, considering um, cleansing the earth and starting anew. Um, and in that time of Badabin, um, Magisi, our eagle, goes and essentially witnesses for us um, and asks Creator to give us more time. And I, I say that because I've been really sitting with that story in this time and as schools and as people in our own communities, I feel like we're in this really important time where we're both having to struggle with surviving the pandemic and the real loss. My partner is Navajo um, and um, we have a lot of family who's been sick. Um, and at the same time, um, how do we make sure that um, the, this time is more than the, um, than the trauma. And I like to remind people, so these are my kiddos when they were young. Um, for us, for Ojibwe people, the jingle dress came out of the Spanish flu pandemic. That is when that came. And so if we think about in Indian country, how powwow has evolved um, and, and, and though there may need to continue to be evolution, um, that jingle dress has served us well um, and has continued and cultivated. And so I, I just like to hold that we're in the middle of this really interesting in-between time that I think we have choices to make. And for schooling in particular, I think one of the key ones we have to think about is what kind of relationship are we making between our systems and our families and communities? Um, and so I'm going to talk more about that because I, I'm very nervous that we're, um, we got on the train of deficit models around suggesting that the worst possible thing for our young people is to spend more time with their families and communities. I'm seeing it in districts all over the place through languages of learning loss. Um, you only get learning loss if you think the only thing valuable to learn is at school. Um, and so I just want to acknowledge that moment 
Um, and before I go too much further, I, I guess I want to say that is that partly for this teaching for me of Badabin is about really asking what story are we telling? What stories are we giving ourselves permission to make? And what stories are we supporting young people to make, live, and tell? And, and I'm really grounding us here in thinking about stories and our story work as our, as our theories for how to be in the world, how to know in the world, what it means to live a good life. Um, and for me, I start there, um, that um, a lot of what um, in all the learning environments that um, I do is I make sure that there that we start with stories. And partly what I've been after is, what does it take for stories to be alive in kids thinking? What does it take for stories to be things that they think with, that they solve problems with, that they imagine with our traditional stories and our familial stories? Um, and can we see that in learning environments? Um, and before I, uh, I, wanna, I wanna point to another way to think about this, and this is kind of big data. Um, part of the reason I've gone after STEAM is because, and science education is because I think we um, are in this time where we're remembering that our knowledge systems are intellectual traditions too. The history of sort of schooling was to set culture and academics in two different places. And in fact, we built systems where you had cultural ways of knowing or cultural practices and traditions, and then you had academics. And those academics were um, positioned as culturally neutral. Um, and I've been really pushing on that for a long time. And one way to make that visible is to recognize um, that 80% of the world's biodiversity is an indigenous territory. So you have to have pretty sophisticated intellectual traditions to be the places in the world where, the, where our natural resources and our systems are the most intact. And, and part of the reason I like to elevate that is, be, is because I think it means that we all have to continue to take our intellectual traditions deeply seriously and not accept the ways that Western intellectual traditions continually are asserting themselves as the thing that structure our teaching and learning. Um, so, and it's mostly because it's also miraculous. So a quarter of all land in the world is still in indigenous control and territory. 40% of terrestrial protected and ecologically intact lands, 40% of ecologically intact lands in the world is because of indigenous, uh, essentially our, our management. Um, and I, I say all this though, at the same time that 95% of the World Wildlife Fund's top 200 climate change spots are also indigenous territory. And part of the reason that is, is because we have the biodiversity and the biodensity in the world, it means big climactic shifts also threaten those places the most. But I, I wanna start here so when we think about what we're up to, we're holding this scope of thing. And for teachers in classrooms, um, sometimes it's helpful to have the big span of what's happening on the earth as we think about what we should be doing instead of only kind of the state level standards or the national standards about these things. So that what we're holding as our accountability and our targets are, are something much broader than sometimes the things that we're sort of forced on to. Um, I'm gonna pause in just a second. Um, and I guess part of what I'm getting at here is that it really means that we have to think about all teaching and learning as political and ethical always. Um, and for me, part of my work has been to say, the design of learning environments is creative and powered. Um, and that part of self-determination is doing things like deciding what our students or our young people should learn, why they should learn it, how they should learn it, where they should learn it, who should teach it. and what we're telling our, our kids they should become, be and become. Um, and partly if we think about education from that perspective, it has been many generations that other people have set those terms. My analogy usually is, is if the United States had, um, if all of the teachers from the United States were actually from other countries, we'd, the US would be in big trouble, people would panic. And yet we have two to 4% of our teachers are native across Indian country. Um, and so largely, our, and it's not that a non-native person can't be a great teacher, right? Or a non-native person can't be a great doctor or a social worker, they can. But when the field is dominated by people other than those from our communities, it signals an imbalance to young people. It signals something implicitly to them that is not actually 
in balance. And I think that part of what happens is that we miss what needs to be emphasized. And this bottom right um, corner is this um, study I did with fourth graders to ask them um, what they thought their science teacher thought was alive and what they thought their elders thought, thought was a living thing. And um, if you look in the right category, it says natural kind. And what that means is things like sun and water and rocks. Um, those things that the Western world calls non-living inanimates and that in many indigenous knowledge systems we talk about as a living thing or a thing with spirit. And the point here is that our kids know that there are differences. And the question is, is how do we develop learning um, environments that support them healthfully navigating those differences and don't demand that they, that they believe in one or the other. And a lot of what we've done is, and a lot of what kids feel like, um, and we have lots of evidence about this, is that their teachers start to demand that they forget what their elders think, or they feel like their communities start to demand that they reject what they're learning in school. And so part of what I'm getting at here is that we often place kids in, in unnarrated and unsupported con conflictual places rather than recognizing that actually we can be more generative and rigor rigorous if we think about both. Um, and most of our communities actually are utilizing parts of Western knowledge in productive ways. I often say, I don't, our ancestors were smart. When they saw something that were smart, that was smart and useful, they used it. I mean, get into the same kind of political battles that I think we sometimes do. And I think the question is, is how do we do that with kids? Um, and for me, um, this has become a key question about how are we constructing what I would call foundational relations between human worlds and natural worlds. And I'm gonna say more about this, but really we're after learning environments that help um, kids learn how to live right relations with lands, waters, and each other. It's really a pretty simple idea it's just hard to accomplish. Um, and so I, I, I wanna say that there are three key things that I um, have been thinking a lot about um, is that how much do our, our learning environments cultivate young people's roles, understandings of their roles, their relations, their responsibilities and their gifts. And I use gifts on purpose. Um, lots of people use the word identities here or um, what their sense of self is. All of those are kind of words that I think are fine, but I've been working with some elders and to recognize that um, part of the differences in our communities compared to Western communities is that we all have different gifts and roles that we're supposed to learn about and, and come into being and that we're not all supposed to be the same. In fact, I have a, I, I've, I've heard this multiple times now is that one of, the, one of the problems is if we're all the same, then we won't need each other. And that's not, that's not actually how functional communities work. People have different gifts that they bring to bear on the collective. So that's that first part. The second one is, um, is helping kids to imagine um, what's possible um, and really to keep dreaming forward. Sometimes we get caught in kind of lost narratives where we are mourning what we think we've lost um, in, instead of imagining um, forward. And sometimes I'll, I'll ask people to say, what will be the traditional story of these times in 500 years? What will be the story that our ancestors tell in, um, in 500 years about these times? What story are we making? Um, and that has to do with the question of what should we do, um, which is a deliberative question. And it's an ethical question. It's a political question. Um, and, and I think that sometimes we've taken young people out of that kind of thing and said that's the realm of adults. And it, it might be, but, um, but young people need to deliberate about these things all the time too. And there's a way that we've kind of taken them out of the intellectual work of thinking about what should we do and minimize their should we's into very particular domains like you shouldn't do drugs or you should go to school um, we haven't always been engaging young people in the big should we questions that are actually the deep substance of life. Um, and so I, I've really been trying to think about that in learning environments. And then the last one that I'll say more about and show you some examples of, of how I'm doing these things is I really think we have to move away from promoting academic achievement to doing something called into what I've been calling intellectual health. Um, and so part of the reason I was excited to do this talk actually is because I, I think lots of people talk about so uh, emotional health or mental health or spiritual health. Um, and we 
almost never to talk about intellectual health. Um, we've let, um, uh, and, I, and I mean that differently than mental health in some ways, but what are healthful ways to deliberate about the world and to think about the world? Um, and what are ways to think about the challenges of Western systems, things like decolonization, things like, things like understanding colonial systems, but also things like how is it that we generate a new um, always, that how is it that we understand cultural transformations as part of life always, not just something we need to do now. And, and for me, those have been, for example, those have been examples of what it means to support intellectual health. Um, and, and I think it comes down to a, a kind of um, making sure that we're reclaiming our own intellectual traditions, but also um, recognizing that um, we can think about many different kinds of knowledge systems and that's okay. The question is, is how are we constructing relationships with them? And so I often say to people in my science learning environments, I want kids to learn Western science and indigenous science. And I want them to be able to think about how they can complement each other, how they can propel each other. I also want them to understand where are they principally different and in conflict with each other? And what are the, what are the possibilities with all of those things? And that to me, the big issue is, is how do we move native kids from, um, from feeling dominated or assimilated, having dominated or assimilative demands in learning environments to ones where they can kind of intellectually thrive and what that looks like. Um, so maybe I'll pause before I keep going and see um, if there are any questions or if you wanna, I, I know I just put a bunch out. So <laughs> is there other things before I jump into examples? Yes, uh, I'll throw it out to the audience. Uh, we're getting a lot of uh, good comments wonderful what you're talking about such medicine for our world today and so i'll throw it out anybody if they have any questions uh uh comments but specifically questions uh you can post it on the facebook uh comment section uh i was wondering about when you talk about i thought that intellectual health was a really good point and and you 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 know and it's not just the emotional health and would you say the intellectual health is tied to like this sort of Paulo Freire critical consciousness and having really engaging critical conversations and, and how to set up those kind of uh, learning environments. I guess just I'm curious if yeah. you can unpack that intellectual health and what that would look like in a classroom or, or in an agency such as Two Feathers, which is more of a community based uh, organization. Yeah. So um, I'm going to show you some examples of where we're going. I, I will say this. I, I am not sure I know what the full scope of intellectual health looks like. Um, I absolutely think that um, critical consciousness is part of it, but I don't think it's sufficient. And in fact, actually, I'm a little bit concerned that we've moved too much down a road of deep criticality um, with critical thinking without what I've been calling critical making or regenerating. So I think about decolonization as one part of this. And I would argue that thinking critically about colonization and doing the work of decolonization is a kind of criticality we need. But I also think about resurgence. And to me, decolonization and resurgence are not the same thing. And, and for me, here's what I'll say is that um, I, I was a former preschool teacher and a Head Start. And um, I often feel like when we think about critical thinking, we've seated young children and we kind of wait until they've survived long enough to get into the critical conversations. Um, and so I, I'm really interested in understanding what does it mean for us to see a kind of education that, that we don't have to first be dominated to then be liberated. Um, and I think we're, I think that's going to take time, but for me, this ethical dimension of education is absolutely part of intellectual health. If we go to, at least for me and the teachings that I've been given from my own community, most of what is most important is how to, how to live a good ethical life. And that for me, both I'll say as an educator, but also as a parent and auntie, I thought hard about, I used to be when I was a youth worker, in my younger days, I'm old enough now to say that that feels like a lifetime ago. Um, I did a lot of critical education. 
And what I've realized over time is that politics and criticality emerges out of one's ethical landscapes, what you think is right. And so that if we spend more time helping kids deliberate about what's right, what's good in the world, their politics would emerge from it. And their ability to see to the heart of what the problem is, I actually think gets clearer. So I'll say more about that, but I think that's the key question is what do people make of it? And for me, this intellectual health is being able to do both of these things, both decolonizing kinds of thought and resurgence and imagining what does that landscape look like um, as always going on. And in fact, actually look at this, this is what I forgot <laughs> is that this is always how I think about this is that there is a kind of decolonial and anti-racist education absolutely inspired by Ferry. Although I'll tell you this, I think at the heart of what that question is, is partly about right relations with lands and waters. Um, and for me, I'm not sure that Frary understood that part of the problem in the world um, is that there's a kind of theory of human supremacy and entitlement. Um, and for me, that's at the heart of the problem, that you don't get to white supremacy, you don't get to kind of the power struggles between different racial and cultural communities, unless you think that there's a particular power structure in the world. And right now we live in a system that is based on what I would call human supremacy, where we turn other life into resource for human consumption and extraction. Um, and so I've been really after saying like, what does the world beyond human supremacy need to be? And our communities and our knowledge systems know that. We're just navigating a system based in human supremacy all the time. And so for me, it's both of these things. Um, and I'm really inspired. I, Vine Deloria is a long-term um, kind of distant mentor. Um, but one of the things that he said is that indigenous education um, uh, from within our intellectual traditions and let, it comes through the land. Um, we, we have a kind of anthropological pedagogy that has happened for a long time. I think it's getting much better where we teach about our culture, not in and through and with the culture learning about everything. And, and Audra, uh, um, so, so uh, Leanne Simpson, and Audra Simpson to, uh, as well, but I'm quoting Leanne here, has talked about like there's an everyday indigenous resurgence and struggle for decolonial territory. So that it's the everydayness of our work. She, Leanne said this beautiful things that our work of our ancestors was living intentionally, creatively every day. Um, and that through that ethic um, actually gave rise to our criticality. And so I think that that's a really important thing as we think about intellectual health, it's how can we go back and forth rapidly actually, because I think that's what's demanded of us all the time. And, and Vine was talking about like, how do we create the conditions for this? So part of it for me um, has been understanding the conditions. And I guess um, part of what I want to say is um, there's a core study of what we've been up to. I'm a, partly a cognitive scientist and we've been studying actually this core control of humans to the natural world. And there's two, this is uh, many, 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 many studies that we could say a lot of things, but I'm just gonna say this is a core thing, is that do we have a model of humans as apart from the natural world um, or that are humans a part of? And this is what I'm talking about a human supremacy, is that what we find is, is that primarily European Americans, we haven't done this globally, um, have a kind of apart from where humans are kind of seen as holding the power and we manage the natural world. And a lot of what we've done with the native communities that we've worked with and, and studied is that actually we tend to have an integrated model that humans are a part of and that we tend to have systems orientations that see multiple roles and we reason about systems. The issue is, is that most of our learning environments actually the, this, this very simple structure is everywhere. So for example, we put children inside boxes for six to eight hours every day where the natural world is sequestered away from them. The very structure of schooling and the way we do it is an apart from model, not a part of. And so a lot of what I've been up to is saying what happens when we no longer imagine schooling or education as inside a box where humans are sequestered. Um, and so that's a lot of what I'm after 
and have been thinking about for a long time. I will say it shows up in our materials everywhere in schools. And I'm just gonna show you some quick data so I can make this concrete for people. Um, we've done series, lots of studies of different things to demonstrate this, but there is a relational narrative and I'm not animated, so you won't be able to say this, but this comes from a study of Google images. Um, and there are three kinds of categories. This top image you'll see is an, is an image of an ecosystem, no people in it though. And the bottom two are two images that came up. One is an ecosystem where the human is apart from this little girl with a magnifying glass, is not in the world, she's above it, studying it. And then you have this other one with a guy fishing in a canoe. What we found in this study is that 98% of the images in the natural world do not include humans. The majority, and those that do end up with them apart from. We've essentially replicated these findings with science curriculum, with school materials everywhere. Part of what my point here is this very simple model is baked into the structures of education all over the place. I have a, I'll, my, I have a former student who's a professor at Uder, U, University of Washington, um, Seattle, uh, Emma Elliott, who actually studies mental health and realized that all of the intake forms presume you're sitting at a desk inside a building. And her dissertation was simply, she went on walks to do intakes and she shifted the formats a little bit and found that you can get the same and more information that you might do from your standardized intake forms for mental health um, in these other kinds of ways. And so I just want to point out that like this very core relationship between human worlds and natural worlds is, is baked into everything. And really what I'm after is saying, what happens if we built new infrastructures or rebuilt our old infrastructures um, and thought about the kinds of narratives that we were giving young people. So I thought what I would do is um, actually showing you a little bit about how I have gone about doing this. Um, and there's methods implications in here um, and, and give you like a texture of what are some learning environments. Um, and so we end up thinking a lot about this. So we call this science education, but um, you know, I really do think about this as the what how and where should we be teaching and learning about nature culture relations. And I'll say this, our science education has as much to do with literacy education or math education or engineering education or art education as anything else. Um, in fact, most of our learning environments have art studios in the afternoon for a couple of hours. So, or people making plays, young people making plays or writing stories. Um, so I don't, I, I'm gonna keep saying STEM education, but, I, but I, I'm hoping everyone can hear me saying like, I, we actually have learning environments that is doing literacy as well and all of the disciplines. Um, and I wanna just acknowledge, um, I've been doing this for going on 20 years um, uh, where we've been co-designing learning environments um, between myself and communities. Um, as part of a re restoration of educational self-determination. Um, and so um, there was a couple of these were mentioned um, in, uh, these are all grants that I've done in a series of things, but I, I wanted to make visible for folks who may be thinking about scholarship or research um, that this is a 20 year relationship with communities and I've been growing um, what communities I'm working with, but but it's not a, it's a different model than most research um, that, that I've been growing these ideas and staying in relationship with communities doing this work for a really long time. Um, and that that's kind of what it looks like in my mind to be ethical about this. Um, but I also wanna acknowledge that the ideas that I'm sharing today aren't mine alone. They've been, I just have kind of the honor, but also the responsibility to help represent the work that we've done together over time. Um, so, so I guess one of the things that I'll say is that I've, I've been talking about this apart from, and I, and I want to make something clear here, um, is that from the very beginning, we first started learning environments inside boxes, also known as community centers. And very, very quickly, 20 years ago, uh, we had elders and folks say, well, if we were for really serious about this, we wouldn't be doing this inside buildings. If we're really serious about trying to change how education happens for our young people, we would go to the land. 
Um, the other thing is, is that people said, well, it's if we really go here, it's deeply political. And I, I just wanted to demonstrate that part of what we've been after for a while is that what might seem like um, an inconsequential relational control in schools leads to particular political conflicts later. And, and I'm being deliberate about saying that I don't think this is just for native communities. When I talk about a 21st century challenge, um, the kind of conflicts on the right can't continue. There has to be an evolution and a shift about that, not just so that it's na not native people who are the ones defending land in all three of these pictures, but that we have systems of governance that actually doesn't, that no one needs to do this. <laughs> Um, and that's part of what I'm talking about. And so for me, the question is, is how do we develop learning environments that cultivates the next generation or next multiple generations? So the things on the right are no longer fathomable. Um, so what have we been doing? Um, we've been after what we call land or water-based education. Some people call it field-based science. Some people call it outdoor ed. Um, I think there are nuances to all of them that matter, but for, for everyone listening, if you're wondering like, how do I find my way into this? If you're doing place-based ed or you know something about outdoor ed, I think that they're all cousins to this and, and um, are close. Um, but we've really been trying to think of like, what are systems of education built from a part of models rather than the apart from? and recognizing that really, if we're serious, that we're gonna do it in land-based ways. And so this picture on the left is um, the science classroom where kids are studying ocean acidification. And part of the way that they're doing that is they're going to tidal, pool, tidal pools and understanding what's happening in the tidal pools. Um, the other thing that we've done is really think about, I'm gonna skip that for time. Um, and, and for folks who might be a little bit skeptical, I think the other thing we have to remember is that even um, dominant scientific paradigms are changing so are legal paradigms really, really fast. And so a lot of what we have done in school or currently do is really dated Western science too. So a lot of what I do with educators is to say, do you know what the cutting edge of science is right now? Now, what are you teaching? Um, and my favorite one, because I like plants, um, is that um, lo and behold, many, many traditional people listening or elders listening um, probably knew this already, but Plants learn and have memory. And 30 years ago, Western science would have said that's quack science and not possible. Now, if you look at the edges of nature or any of the most cutting edge, prominent scientific journals, they're all about new understandings of plant life and their communicative capacities. It's stuff that we've known, but even Western science has got some things that are changing. Or for example, that survival of the fittest may not be an accurate account of how evolution happens, that actually symbiosis and multi-species interactions is how ecosystems work, um, and that we've been actually perpetuating a, 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 an imbalanced model that even Western science doesn't understand. There are things happening like the international rights of nature or this deliberation about like, should trees have standing? It's a really interesting book about recognizing how it's only humans that have legal rights. The rest of life has resource boundaries or are protected in particular ways, but don't have rights. There's important disruptions to that. New Zealand is a remarkable example where Maoris have been able to get their mountains and their rivers have legal standing. Um, there's some happening in Bolivia. There are places in the world where we're moving beyond a human centric or human only rights paradigm too. I say all this to say that when we, some of this may sound like it's different than what we know. But if we're serious about preparing our next generation, this is the edge of both Western science and Western legality and legal systems as well. And so as we reach to think about this, are we reaching far enough to recognize that our young people are, are potentially the leaders in all realms, not just in our own knowledge systems and kind of recognizing that we can lead. Um, should I pause again before I show some examples of of a learning environment? Yeah, we can uh, take uh, one question. Uh, you know, there's a lot of questions coming. I'm trying to keep up on them. Uh, we uh, we uh, have one that says, uh, it's kind of, you've already talked about it, but uh, what can we do as a community 
to mobilize outdoor school for our local schools. There seems yeah. to be some support, knowledge, and engagement around the concept. But what are the steps to pass these policies through the curriculum process or just how to, you know, so I think it's more of an implementation question. Sure. Let me let me show a little bit about how we got here, because I think that's the key question. I think that there's a big difference between um, what I see people often do is want to take indoor school outdoors. They don't want to transform schooling. They just change the backdrop. Um, and I think actually remembering and relearning how to teach with the land is actually a process. And, and for us, the, the, beginning, the beginning part was that we had to be able to do it as adults and families. And we started there. So it was far less um, policy perfect <laughs> at the beginning. Um, but we also did this thing, this comes from this tool is that we realized that we had to shift how we were doing curricular planning and mapping. So often what schools do is they start with the learning objectives and then they plan towards them. And what we really did is actually start with our lands and waters, map them literally, map the practices, walk your lands and waters, think about what it means to know them deeply. What would you have to understand? What would a young person have to understand? What are all the phenomena in order for them to really understand their places and set your learning goals that way? One of the things that we've done over time is that we've realized that actually you usually get to all of the required state or federal standards anyway. It's just a question of what leads and whether or not you'll let yourself go through a process first. So many teachers that do this now will map their lands and waters near their school. And I mean this really pragmatically. So this, this is an example from a science teacher at Chief Kitsap Academy. Um, she's not there anymore, but she redid her planning based on this map. For some teachers, you may not have the ability to um, go on field trips daily. To, um, and so I actually have people do a 45 minute walking radius from their school, map that land, and then imagine what you could do. But the first thing is actually to think about how are you setting your learning, uh, um, your learning objectives and where are they coming from? Um, and what's that process? And then I, I think that the other thing that um, I would say is that there are eight things that um, over 20 years I've seen over and over and over again as part of these learning environments. Um, but one, I think we all have to go to intergenerational learning environments. Age segregation is a product of the industrial revolution and colonial schooling. There's not one good piece of Western science or indigenous science that says age segregation is the best way to learn. So I really do think we have to take seriously what does intergenerational learning mean and how do we reimagine that. Now, I'm not saying that it always happens in our learning environments. We typically got kind of come together and apart. I run programs that are for kindergarten through 12th graders. We have elders who are teachers. We have those of us who are middle aged. We have young, young youth workers. And then we have that full range of kiddos. And sometimes we're doing things in mixed age groups. Sometimes we do break off where little kids will go, where middle schoolers will be together, where teenagers will be together. So I'm not saying that it always has to be, but it needs to be dynamic. Right now, we set up learning environments where we have age segregation as the norm. So that's my very first thing. By the way, I'm sure that all of us will say like, well, yeah, that's how families work. Um, we don't tend to have age segregated families in quite that way. We spend, we have those inter, intergenerational interactions. Um, we start with our stories and songs and we bake that in. And literally every classroom starts with the beginning. Most schools start with the beginning. Thinking carefully about what your beginnings are all the time um, is one of the things that I would encourage everyone. How do you make a policy about that? It's not that hard. You can set up your school so that you start every morning with a morning assembly where maybe it's outside, outside where there's song, where there's story to start the day. But, but it's creating that routine practice differently. Um, we have focused on remaking relations. And this is really about making sure that you're seeing um, more than humans as relatives. And, and disallowing them to become um, natural resource for human consumption only. Um, there's a reason that our subsistence practices have some protocols around them. It's simply about making those protocols part of everyday life again in, in meaningful ways. Um, we've also done the work, I'm just gonna skip quick because we're getting close to time. Um, we've also done the work uh, of 
always doing some harvesting and restoration work. And this is connected to making sure we have right relations to recognize that when you take something, you need to give back in particular ways. Um, and to have kids really learn that, we often don't actually give kids much of an opportunity to help restore anything, right? Um, and we give, we tell them that their responsibilities are, are kind of towards those that I think coloniality has put in motion, except for maybe in our families. Right? We have lots of family responsibilities that I think young people um, uh, still have. But in schools, we reduce their responsibility to things like homework completion and effort. And while those are important, um, they're not necessarily the things that move your spirit, that make you feel needed. Right, And those restore restoration kinds of things need to be towards actually communal good. Um, and the last thing I'll just highlight here is that we engage in making. So I, I really do think that the, re the removal of arts from kids' everyday life is, is, a, is a really big problem around the atrophying of creative thought. Um, and for kids thinking and being positioned as makers in the world um, and knowers in the world from different kinds of ways. Um, uh, uh, Roger Fernandez is a storyteller that I, I, I think of as a mentor and teacher um, and he, he, he oftentimes has said, school has taught kids to make lists and projects, not stories that explain how things are or help your heart know. Um, some version of that, he doesn't say it exactly like that every time, but he's really juxtaposed like why art is so important. And I really, really agree. And if we think about um, most schools have reduced art, they've taken it out or they've even reduced playground outside time. So um, the ways that we've engaged kids in school is that the playground is playtime. We've literally not structured uh, thinking time or learning time in the, out in the outdoor spaces. So I know you asked a specific thing. Part of what I'm getting at is that I don't think there's a, I don't know, I haven't done the work of saying like, well, what would it mean if a school district said, okay, let's do all outdoor school right now. Um, and if any district is excited to do that, I am excited to help you think about that for anyone listening. Um, but what I've done is actually done it by kind of changing over time to learn how to do that. Um, because I don't think it's as simple as moving outside. I think there's a lot of change in, in, in pedagogy to do it. Um, I also think it takes models and, and helping to organize so that teachers know what to do. Um, and I was gonna show you um, Another project, the stuff I was showing you is that I've been up to this in a K-3 for schools specifically. Um, and I guess what I'd say is that partly it means like figuring out, this is a project that is not for native communities only, but I've, we've been doing this work with schools specifically to say, what is it you have to be committed to? And this is just an example and you can find lots of details online about this if you're interested. But like what needs to be made clear um, for educators if they're going to do it. And then how do you build models? And this is our, our model. We're calling this a seasonal storyline for field-based science education. Um, and it's really helping teachers know what do you need to do? How do you do this? Um, and for us, it's been a process of really uh, thinking about schools and classrooms as porous, where really our job is to help facilitate kids being in right relationships with their lands and their families and communities. So what does it really mean to do that? And it means planning for that. It means not having school be the center of everything. Um, and, and I can say more about this model, but I won't right now. I guess what I wanted to say is a couple of things is it also means laying out your frameworks. Um, and this for us is probably one of the more important ones around place and how we've gotten here is that we really have these six dimensions of what we call socio-ecological histories of place that we build curriculum around that we want kids to understand this paradigm called geologic time, what we call plant, animal, and soil time, indigenous people's time, nation state time, global time, and then what we've called living ethical responsibilities and possibilities time. And this is really about making sure that we're always creating space where kids are thinking about and having, um, getting engaged in doing the, the work of future making. Um, and for us, um, if someone is interested, we're releasing, there's two things that I'll say is we've been thinking about this deeply in this time um, and trying to create learning environments that we think families might do together. And this question of like, what's the school policy? I, 
I think it's what's the family and community engagement model. And that if we actually centered families and communities first and thought about and really built out from what would families and communities need to, to thrive, that that could, that that combined with starting with our lands, what do we need to know? That if that drove the curriculum, if that drove what our practice and policy was, we would get a very different thing. Um, and, and so for us, we've really, um, we've been working on that with schools. Um, and so that as everyone's working and like, it's so hard to serve or to do the things that we need to do right now, once you get past connectivity issues, which are still there um, for sure, but, but they're not the totality, right? Like people are making phone calls to each other people are still in contact with each other. So if we think as systems about like, why is it so hard right now? It tells us a little bit about the relational quality between our lands and waters and between our systems and our families and schools right now. Um, and we might really be able to remake those um, in, in really concrete ways. Um, so I think, I can't believe it. This hour went by way faster than I thought it was gonna be, but maybe so we, I'll stop. We have a little, one uh, one of our uh, Prairie streams she said, please don't skip faster. This is so powerful and helpful. So uh, <laughs> we have a little bit of time if, if you have a little bit of time left. Sure, sure, uh, sure. So I think, you know, one of the things that, uh, that you've touched on, I've seen in your work and, and kind of what you're, uh, at least partly some of what I took from what you're talking about is this idea of, uh, like design ethics and ethics and really like what, you know, what is the good life uh, according, you know, that is, that is maybe against this sort of material capitalist domination sort of ideology or, or uh, mindset or that, that we're often socialized that individualizes social, structural, systemic issues and, and you know, promotes this sort of narcissism uh, so I'm, I'm wondering if you could, you know, unpack that a little bit more as, as maybe a way of summarizing, but also just, you know, I think that it's an important point. Yeah. Well, this for me is connected to kind of this human supremacy point. You don't get capitalism unless you think non-human life is materials for money production. Um, and so I, I think that really like, at the core of why we have uh, capitalism and some of the key problems is that we have disrupted this relationship, um, this key relationship about one, what is ethics and what is a good life, but but what is our what are our roles in the broader world? And and at least for me in my own community, but also what I've been taught about other communities, we all have stories about how humans have lost their way or made silly mistakes because our egos got out of control or needed to be humbled or or actually helped right and so for me part of what you're asking is like how do we think about our traditional stories about our traditional teachings and and take the ethics from them think about what are the ethics embedded in our good lives about what it means to be a good human being and what role human beings are need, and how do we transform them and think about them in this in this moment? Um, and I think, you know, every generation has work to do. Linda Smith said that to me recently, and I, I really love that phrase. But I also think it means that every generation has to help each new generation learn how to live our ethics in our times. And because we have such a history of loss we engage in all kinds of ways of boxing what that could mean. And so, so for me, capitalism doesn't have ethics. Mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't. Um, and it, or it doesn't have an ethics as a line. It does have ethics. Let me just be clear. It doesn't have any ethics that I like. <laughs> um, and I think there's a difference between um, deciding whether or not an individualistic ethics versus a collective or communal ethics is what we're gonna build systems on. And, and right now we have a system that is focused on an individual. Not everywhere in the world has done that. 
by the way. There are other systems that think about collective, but we, and we can see it unfolding in the country now. We have protests going on about whether or not um, we should be communally responsible for each other's health. It's a perfect example of whether or not you wear, you know, right now, if we wear a mask, it's, it's actually not for my individual health that I wear a mask. Mm -hmm. It's so that I, it's for everyone else. And that is not, that actually is a really interesting ethical dilemma and a difference than most of our systems. From the very beginning, what we do with kids, and I would argue that actually most of what I've learned about young native kids and myself, all of us, is that we wanna be claimed by our communities and we wanna have a role to contribute. We wanna contribute something. Um, and that actually is about a collective well being. There's actually really lovely studies. Steph Freiberg has done amazing studies that demonstrate for working class kids, too. Working class white kids um, also prefer, and actually, it's, they do better if they're put in a collective and a we instead of an I kind of frame. Mm -hmm. So for me, systems about the collective is really, is really necessary. And, and, and capitalism just isn't doing that. Um, and I think the other piece about capitalism, I'll just keep saying this, is that it's really human supremacy at its core. It, it, it thinks it can mine and drill without consequence. Um, so there's just a lack of reciprocity in capitalism um, with, with the natural world that, that we are learning the limits. We are at the limits of Earth's capacity in many, many ways. And it's partly why um, I, I think we have to learn this as a human species um, mm -hmm. in this time. There will be another world, at least where I come from, we're in our seventh world, maybe entering into our eighth anyway. Um, and so that's gonna come. Winona LaDuke has talked about this before is that we're at the end of the capitalist addiction to to fossil fuels and like addicts, addicts when their drug is about to run out act badly. Um, and, and so maybe we're in that time and there'll be a next, she talks about is what's the next economy. And I, and I guess I'll say this, all communities have economics. That's not, it's not that economics itself is bad. Um, the question is, is what ethics run your economies, right? And so we don't overfish. We had ways that we limited ourselves. We, we had principles that actually kept us within, within limits that I, that I think are really important um, that we just don't, we haven't figured out the systems or even tried systems with, with some of those ethical bounds connected to them. All right, thank you. And I guess one last question and, and maybe a follow-up question to the sort of ethics is also this, this idea of like design research and, 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 and a design ethic. And I know one of the things that you talk about is how does you design learning environments where there's transformative agency, you know, there's a, a cultivating an everyday indigenous resurgent. And you've talked about that in your presentation today in our conversation. I just, you know, wanted you to maybe further unpack that as again, a, a way to, to, summarize uh, our conversation in your presentation for those, you know, teachers and students and others uh, that uh, may be still listening. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate you pulling that back up. So this is connected to the question, what policies? So for me, um, a design ethic isn't always learning and changing ethic. It's a living system ethic about uh, what needs to be learned by whom, when, um, and it also is a generous way to approach this um, because I, I think when we're trying things new, anew or when we're trying to shift things, we make mistakes. And one thing that I think happens is that we try something and it doesn't go perfect. And so when we say that didn't work, let's try another idea. And, and you know, there's stories about what, where our baskets came from. Nobody made a perfect basket the first time they tried. Um, that's just not, if we think about how we make new things or we make beautiful things in our communities, there's all these processes of trying, not getting it quite right, trying again. And for me, design work is like that. Design work is doing our best thinking about what we want, doing the practices that get us ready for that, for that implementation, implementing, and then doing hard reflective work, seeing what worked well, what didn't work well and why and trying again. And I would argue that's what the beauty of teachers is. 
um, is that as educators, I think that's built into how we do things. Um, I just think that sometimes we don't think big about that. So for me, the design ethic and design research is really about like trying to move us to living systems and continual improvement about these things. Um, but it also means asking that um, those hard questions and doing it, who's sitting, who's designing? So like I said, I started out by saying and realizing that we don't often ask families to help design schools or elders to help design schools or kids to help design their schools or their learning environments. Um, and so I think if we think about preparing for something, for preparing for something important, for me, if I'm gonna host a giveaway, because there's some important event, I spend a really long time preparing for that. I think about the things carefully and I don't do it solo. I'll consult with different people. For me, learning environments is like that that you go and you think about what is this important thing called educating our young people? And what are all the perspectives that need to be held as we do this thing? And, and we continue to build that way. Um, and I guess part of what I'm getting at is there is a policy here. And in some ways we might say, well, we have school boards or we have, right, we have a committee that selects and we have representatives from community. And I wanna be really clear that those are good, but not sufficient in my mind. Um, that, that that doesn't create a collective sense of transformative agency. It helps set up that there are some decision makers in community and others. Now there may be ways to build out that, but this, this point about transformative agency and collective transformative agency is that people have to make decisions. And it means when you make decisions that you have to be willing to take the, both the responsibility of those decisions as well as the potential um, beauty in those decisions. But if we've taken decision-making away from everyday life, then people feel like their lives are less consequential. Like, does it really matter? I, I think about my cousins and my nieces and nephews that sometimes when we ask questions like, what do we want for dinner? Doesn't matter, whatever. On the one hand, that couldn't be a like, whatever we do is fine with me. But I think that if kids are feeling a life of, it doesn't really matter what I say, or if community feels like it doesn't really, it doesn't really matter what I say, or families or parents feel like it doesn't really matter what I say or what I want, then you're out of the practice of having to think about it and make a recommendation to, or make a suggestion. And so for me, this transformative agency is getting back in the practice of both making suggestions, having them be potential tentatives or let's tries, and living with both like, a, ooh, God, that went bad. That is not what I had hoped for. What do I need to do to fix it? As kind of routine. And unfortunately, our school systems have become more and more punitive, both for teachers as well as for kids and families. And so we have to think about our systems of mistakes and how we're supporting kind of exploration and mistakes as part of it. Um, mistakes have become dangerous and consequential in a way that doesn't really help anyone feel free to try or want to try. And you can see it, kids will be like, tell me what you want me to do, get clearer. And they'll, they, they wanna be rule followers and schools are really creating people who wanna follow rules, not be creative imaginers. So for me, transformative agency is like cultivating that sense of like, I don't know, but I, I'll try. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the same is true for educators. And would just a little follow up on that last point? Would you say that with the the do as I say and 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 uh, this lack of sort of like developing curiosity and, and questioning, there's a a big class socioeconomic piece to it, right? Yeah, I I mean, so if you're getting at um, absolutely, um, and I think this becomes about like do. Is this a way to, so how are we, we recognizing human dignity always, right? Or are only suppose, some people able to make decisions uh, treated like intellectual beings that have ideas, that have insights? Um, and so part of what I hear you getting at, and we know this is true. In fact, there's lots of studies about this, that if you look at the, there's a huge variation in the types of questions kids get asked to answer in school. And for 
schools that serve predominantly kids of color and poor kids, they get what people call known answer questions. They're right, wrong. They're, you either got the question right because there's a known answer, it's quizzes. They don't get asked thought questions. They don't get asked ambiguous questions. They don't get asked questions that there isn't a right answer to, there's, there's, there's only ways into. Um, and so that variation is part of why the what should we do question for me. If all kids had education that continually asked them to consider what, they, what should be done for themselves, for their families, for their communities, I think that you would get to very different discourse all the time. That what, would, what it would require to get to those kind of deeper meanings, rigorous answers to, or thinking about what should we do about X, Y, or Z, you would see a really different kind of engagement over time. Thank you. That's this has been a, a fabulous uh, conversation, and you know I know we have a lot of comments. And uh, thank yous for uh, you taking the time out of your day to uh, talk with us. You know uh, I wanted to to throw it back to you if you have anything. Uh, I know there's uh, Philip Bell has shared some of your uh, programs and stuff online. If you wanted to uh, that you guys are doing with the STEM, STEAM program in Chicago, but anything that, you know, where can the audience find you, what your, some of your research is uh, today and, and what yeah. we should be uh, uh, excited about in, in your uh, research and your work. Thank you. It's really funny to me that Phil reminded me to tell people. So I have a couple of websites with lots of materials. There's our Learning in Places um, has tons of materials for families and schools. Um, so it's, um, and we also have a website where we're distributing all kinds of materials we've been making for Indigenous STEAM that are also free to folks. So um, I can either post on the Facebook site or you can actually just um, Google for them. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm continuing to do this. What we're actually building out is a series of professional developments for educators that are longer term um, professional supports to actually work towards transforming this. Um, when I was at the UW, um, there, UW has a lovely program called the Native Education Certificate Program that I helped to, um, to build. Um, I taught in it this past cohort, but I'm no longer a faculty member there, but that is a really excellent resource for helping people think about that. And um, I'm building out a similar one though, difference that was really about like, what's a resurgence school is what I'm really after is, if I think that resurgence and, and education that supports our resurgence. So um, if you're interested, please be in touch with me. I didn't, I'm terrible at this stuff. This is the stuff that I'm absolutely terrible about that I never share with people, but I'm happy. My email, um, actually, I think I can, I can do this right here. Um, Oh no, it's not on the screen. Oh yeah, you could. I think maybe just put the font black. Oh uh, yeah. Um, if anyone wants to email me, I'm happy to share. Um, and I think. Uh, for me, the the big thing that I'm after now is actually helping to support um, educators and communities that are wanting to build new models. Like, how can I be of help? So it's really an invitation. If if there if you have follow up questions or would like to help, um, and then I bet you Phil put links to our websites that I just mentioned in the in the Facebook chat. So yes, um, yeah. Thanks so much. I'm. Um, I'm happy to be here and share, and I uh, look forward to hearing about all the good work that folks are up to as well. Yeah, thank you too. And uh, for those of you that uh, are tuning into our speaker series, we'll have uh, Mary Catherine Nagel tomorrow at 12 o'clock. Uh, and then on uh, Friday, we will have uh, the educator, African-American activist, Howard Fuller on uh, at 12 o'clock, both uh, tomorrow and Friday. Uh, so have a good rest of your Tuesday and thank you for tuning in.